All right. I invite you to John, the Gospel of John, chapter 3. We're going to be in the first 21 verses together. John 3, we're going to be in the first 21 verses. Uh, the, today we're going to be talking about a interaction between Jesus and a man by the name of As we consider in the teaching that Jesus brings, we're going to consider what, is, what does it tell us about who Jesus is? As we've been walking through the Gospel of John, we're reminded of the purpose uh, back in, or if we look forward to John chapter 20, verse 31, he says, these things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the of God and that by believing you may have life in his name. And so the invitation of the gospel of John as we read it, as we open it up, is for the reader to believe. This is an invitation for the unbeliever to consider the claims of Christ and the work of Christ and to believe, to trust in Jesus because belief is not just an intellectual agreement is a trust and a confidence in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And so our prayer as we dig into this narrative, even in chapter is that this would deepen our faith in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Uh, that if you are an unbeliever and you are continuing to seek Jesus and consider the claims of Christ, that you would consider them and by the stirring of the Spirit come to faith in Jesus as your Savior and your Lord. And this is also a great invitation for us as believers as we get to share our faith with others as God opens up opportunities in our circles of influence as we can direct them to the Gospel of John or point them to scriptures therein. So as we walk through our text together, the invitation is the life that we have in Christ Jesus, our Savior and our Lord. And so let's go ahead and dig into the text. Then the first 21 verses, we'll read them together. 3 verse 1 says this, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, what do these things be? Jesus answered, said to him, are you the teacher of Israel, and you don't know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is, the Son of Man who is in lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deed should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. The word of the Lord. As we get to dig into uh, John chapter 3, take a look at this nice uh, portion of Scripture here in the first 21 verses of chapter 3. We're continuing to consider who is Jesus. Consider who is Jesus, the invitation to believe to trust, to place our confidence in the person who works 
and experience the fullness of life that he offers, the abundant life in his name that is experienced now as believers and, is, and we experience the benefits of it as well in eternity. So who is Jesus? What does this interaction and this teaching that Jesus brings tell us about who he is? In the first four verses, we're introduced to the interaction. We get an introduction to the interaction between Nick and the interaction with Jesus. Uh, up to this point, Jesus has already begun his earthly ministry. We've already talked about how he's called some disciples. In the last part of chapter 2, we talked about how he cleansed the temple and he has the authority to do it on his terms. And he does so accordingly. Around Passover, we heard that he began to do many signs. It doesn't tell us in John exactly what those signs are. But as he kicks off his ministry, crowds are starting to follow. People are starting to come to him. And we're introduced to this man by the name of Nicodemus in the first two verses. Nicodemus is a successful man. He's a significant man. As we read about him, we read about a man who's a, a, a man among the Pharisees. He's also a ruler of the Jews. Now, within the Jewish faith, there were multiple Jewish sects or groups. There's two that we often hear about in Scripture are the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Pharisees, you could describe them as the, the conservative uh, Jews of their day, the Sadducees were more described as the liberal Jews of their day. Uh, religiously speaking, uh, the Pharisees, they committed themselves to the law of God. And, you know, a lot of times when we take a look at the Pharisees or we talk about Pharisees, we talk about them in negative terms. After all, they were those who at times practiced hypocrisy. They thought they were better than others, and they challenged Jesus on many occasions. But the Pharisees, their intent from the very beginning were to be separate ones. That's what a Pharisee means. A Pharisee is a separate one, one who is set apart to the law of God to preserve their identity as Jews and to preserve their purity as Jews. You can trace the beginning of the Pharisees back to Daniel in chapter 1 and chapter 3 where Daniel and his friends refused to eat the food that their captors try to provide them. They refused to bow their, their knee to the king and worship him like a god. And so these Pharisees have followed this tradition up to this point. But by the time we get to 600 years later in the first century, uh, they become a bit legalistic. Uh, when you think about the Pharisees in the first century, they had what was called the Mishnah, and what the Mishnah was, was a bunch of laws that they added to the Mosaic law. Uh, for instance, they had one law, you know, within the Old Testament is you got to uh, keep the Sabbath day holy. You know, you work six days, the, se the seventh day, you rest. And so in order to obey that law, they had in the Mishnah 24 chapters on how specifically to honor that one law. And so they were quite legal. They did, they... Every I, every T, and we it comes to Nicodemus. He's one of the religious elites of his day. He's one a man among the age. He's learning the law. He's memorizing the word of God, and so he's a successful man. He's a significant man. He's also described as a, a man who's a ruler of the Jews. What that tells us is that he is on the council of what's called the Sanhedrin uh, during. The, the, the years in the first century, you had those who ruled over the Jews. They served kind of as the Congress or the Parliament and also the Supreme Court. And so when you had to deal with matters, it came to the Sanhedrin. It, it consisted of the high priests and these 70 others. And guess who's on that council? Nicodemus. So as we're introduced to Nicodemus in just the first verse, he's a successful man, he's a significant man, he's a, a man among the Pharisees, and he's a ruler of the Jews. As we continue to read about him, we get to see that he's a strategic man as well. It says, this man came to Jesus by night. Doesn't come to him during the day. There's a couple of reasons why he may not have come to Jesus during the day. Large crowds are starting to flock towards Jesus. I mean, if you want to have a dialogue with Jesus and have a one-on-one -on -one conversation and really get to know what he's teaching, 
you come at night. So Nicodemus, for whatever reason, he, he, he comes at night, he can have a dialogue, he can talk to Jesus and talk to him face to face and learn exactly who he is and what he teaches as we discern who this Jesus is. Because is he a man? Is he a prophet? Is he the Christ, the Son of God? Is he the one who provides eternal life? Is he the Messiah that they have been waiting for? And so he comes at night. But another reason why he comes at night is because he's on the Sanhedrin. I mean, you've got other folks on the council, uh, religious individuals. You've got uh, well-known statesmen who are experienced in what they do. And so Jesus, you know, you're hanging out with, I mean, Nicodemus, you're hanging out with this guy. Jesus, you're asking him questions. People start to talk. What's that guy Nicodemus up to? And so probably for a combination of these two reasons, Nicodemus, he, he comes to Jesus and he comes at night. And also a man seeking truth. Now, a number of occasions as you walk through the Gospels and you read about these interactions with Jesus and the Jewish leaders, often it's quite negative. I mean, they're always trying to challenge Jesus. But the manner in which he speaks to, to Jesus seems to be a man seeking truth. Notice that he first calls Jesus rabbi. In a moment, in verse 10, Jesus is going to say, you're the teacher of the Jews. And so Nicodemus, there wasn't an actual question that was the teacher of the Jews, but what that means is, Jesus says it, if you check in verse 10, it means that he was in among us. He was well in the word of God, the law of God, and he was the teacher of the word of God. So him, to Jesus, this new guy who's come on the scene, who's doing miracles, teaching crowds, and he calls him rabbi. He, he basically deals a colleague. I mean, this Jesus is, and he's just upstart. And Nicodemus says, you to see in verse 2, it says, the man came to Jesus. He said, Rabbi, we know that you are a for no we're impressed. It's got, to be, it's got to be that God is with you because a man can't do the signs and miracles that you do unless he is indeed a man of God. So Nicodemus comes to him strategically, comes to him at night, comes to him seeking the truth. And then we get Jesus. First, uh, before we overlook it, Jesus answered him. Seeking who Jesus is, who he is, maybe that that season of your faith where you where you, you, you haven't gone all your life, but you're seeking him. The neat thing when you call out to him and you seek him, find him. He answered Nicodemus, and he answered him in the way that Nicodemus. We're down, need. Jesus says in verse 3, most assuredly I say to you, in, in, uh, <laughs> assuredly, let me tell you something. When I speak, I speak authoritatively. Jesus. Most assuredly has authority because Jesus just a man, he's a prop. He's not just, he's the word among us to cleanse a temple. The words that he says to salvation. If you want to know how to get to heaven, Jesus is going to say it. So, listen up a man of authority is about to speak. Jesus says, unless one is. Born in the kingdom of God. The significant chapter, this idea of being born again. If you take a look at the Greek and the translation there, it can be translated born again. It can be translated born from above. Jesus looks at Nicodemus who 
was a, who's a man who is a Pharisee from his earliest days. He knows the law. He memorizes the law. I mean, he keeps the law. Crosses as many as he can. And Jesus says, if you want to see the kingdom, the realm of the rule of God, you've got to be born again. You've got to be born from above. A Nicodemus of your day. And say, okay, Nicodemus, Nick, you're three quarters of the way there. You know, you're almost there if you just continue to, to follow the path and you continue to obey the law and you continue to work harder. If you continue to do what you're going to do, that's how you're going to see the kingdom of God. No, there's nothing you can do. All you can do is be born. Again, and then you'll see the kingdom of God, the realm of the rule of God. And the expectation is that a Messiah would come and would deliver Israel from the rule, who would usher in the kingdom of God. And as the kingdom of God came, a, 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 a blessed Israel would rule among expecting a reign and to rule. We know Jesus came the first suffering servant. He came to seek and to save the second as a conqueror. Come after all this happens with back again and you have the millennial reign of Christ on the earth and you have a 12 a promise given to Abraham of land seed and blood in that is the fulfillment of the kingdom of God you want to see not to be born again from Jesus just who Nicodemus study scripture he's known time and then in and says you got now if you I've uh, been out later they uh, often you hear those about those born again Christians it's one of those it sounds like it's it's a group within Christian but can I tell you there's only one kind of Christian you, there's a Christian, and you can only be, you're either a Christian or you're not a Christian, you know? You know, sometimes those born-again Christians, those are the crazy folks, right? Those are the folks who actually take Christianity seriously. Those are the happy, clappy type of Christians. Those are the, the, the born-again believers. Those born-again Christians, those are the folks who, you know, they, they've had a rough life. They found themselves addicted to various things and they ended up in prison for a, a certain amount of time and then they met the Lord and they were born again. There's one kind of Christian and it's a born again Christian. You're either born again and you're a Christian or you're not born again or not. In other words, you don't get to heaven or see heaven Experience heaven, enter into heaven on your own works, your own ability. You can only enter in if you're born again. Nicodemus, having heard what Jesus had said, you got to know Nicodemus is an man. He's a successful man. He's a man who is, he knows how to debate. And as Nicodemus responds to Jesus, he says, how can a man be born when he is old? Nicodemus, of course, is thinking in physical terms. Can he enter in a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And so the question, you know, it's, now if you were in the position and Jesus just told you, listen, you've got to be born again. It's like, Jesus, what are you talking about? You've got to be born again? I can't go into my mother. It almost sounds sarcastic, you know. Nicodemus, are you being sarcastic with Jesus here? Hey, what do you want me to do? Go back in my mother's womb? Man, and to be born again. And in the first four verses, before we're going to walk into the instruction, we get an introduction to this interaction between Nicodemus and Jesus. This, just in the first reveal to us about Jesus, this is the source of truth. 
giver. If you want, if you want to get down, creative. This is the truth, and He is the giver of truth. If you want to, if I could give you just a discussion, it would be the first to speak the truth in Jesus and his word. The gospel of John is an invitation to the reader to believe. And you have to seek it. Discover if these things are true. Continue to pray and say, God, if these things are true, and I'm going to reveal these things, and I'm ready to try. Thank you, Savior and Lord. Continue. If you're a believer, may your faith be strengthened as you continue to seek Jesus. Now, as a church, we very, very greatly value the word of God. It's, it's, it's powerful, it's life-changing, it's transforming. But if you read the word of God and you study the word of God and you're in the word of God, we can... And we dig into it, you come to something. You miss this, you miss the whole thing. When you open the word, we're supposed to have an inner person and work of Jesus Christ. If Jesus is the source of the truth, let's seek and discover the truth in that. Hear the word. If Jesus is the source of Jesus and his word, now, um, tonight and on Sunday mornings, we make it a priority at our church to... to about out. I remember when I first read through the Bible, and, but it didn't work out longer but i still remember when i read through the read it in my mind but there's something about the word being read aloud something powerful about the word being read aloud in your marriage there's something powerful about the word of god when your family is present there's something powerful about the word aloud when the church is gathered together as we hear the word of God. Now, it's one thing to, to find different texts that relate to it and then interpret it and then bring application to it. But what a wonderful place to start by simply reading an errant creative word of God. If Jesus is the truth and the source of truth, let's hear the truth. And then thirdly, let's share the truth of Jesus. Jesus is, and the truth and it's not that we bring people to church we bring people to Jesus we don't just invite them to a small group gathering or hey we're watching a Christian film out and join us no we're interested in bringing people to Jesus and if that is our focus it aligns everything else in its place and so Jesus is the truth, he is the source of truth. He is the giver of truth. Does the world offer to the truth of God his word? What is the truth and the source? What are the alternatives that the world has or that the world offers us? What's the alternatives? Yeah. Yeah. So man, own intellect and logic and yeah, yeah. yeah. Christy, what were you gonna say? Something? Yeah. So what feels good, follow it. You know, if it feels good, do it. Yeah. So just follow your heart. A subjective experience, yeah. 
their truth. You follow, I'll follow mine. We'll go again. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Satan, Satan's counterfeits. When you have the authentic, genuine thing, uh, Satan's got his, his counterfeits. You've got false religion, and you've got all the rest. Yes, yes. Yeah, Steve. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So straight up willful, willful ignorance, and you're not interested in... Finding truth, you're content with what you know. Yeah, yeah, Bruce. Truth is, truth for a lot of people is just relative. Yeah. And so therefore, that's why I said the first time that I don't think bad things sometimes. And uh, there's truth in the Quran, and there's truth in philosophy, there's truth everywhere. So you're a narrow person. Yeah. Maybe it's just a narrow person, and there are a lot of things around you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so just the r- relative world we live. Everything's relative and nothing's true and nothing is absolute. Yeah, philosophical uh, thought processes. Yeah. yeah, anything else? Anything else? Yeah, there's so many alternatives to, to the truth of Jesus who claims truth and who is the source of truth and who is also the giver of it. Isn't it great that Jesus is not just the source of truth, but he provides the truth, that he's revealed himself through his word? I mean, Jesus, the word of God, became flesh and dwelt among us. Not only is God the truth, but he came to this earth to show forth that it's true, that he is the truth. And then if that wasn't enough, he died on the cross three days later. He rose again in newness of life. If that doesn't prove the truth, I mean, what does? And so we begin and we enter into the interaction that we see, the interaction between Jesus and Nicodemus and, and Jesus as he begins this conversation. Remember the last question in Nicodemus. How does that work? You have to be born again, to be born from above. Do you, do you go back into your mother's womb? Secondly, we get to see not just the introduction to the interaction, but secondly, the instruction of Jesus given to Nicodemus concerning what it means to be born again. Verse 5, Jesus answered. And a nice, a dialogue is at hand. We get to see this conversation take place. I just want to stop here, not overlook it for the moment, just encourage us. Have conversations with God. You know, sometimes we don't feel, you know, like we can express to God how we actually feel, you know, but you can. You know, you read the Psalms, you certainly can. Be honest with God. It's not like you're, you're, you're tricking him, you know. He knows what's in your heart. You might as well share it with him. Now, the psalmists, they always, they always close the circle and they, and they declare who God is in relationship to them. But if you're feeling a certain way, be honest with God. Talk to him. Have a conversation with him. Dig into his word. Spend time in prayer. Jesus answered, most assuredly. Once, once more, he, 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 he speaks from authority. <laughs> once again, before he speaks, he says, this is true. This is authoritative. Whenever you hear me speak, listen up, because this is true. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So verse 3, he said, you can't see the kingdom of God unless you're born again. Here he says, you can't enter the kingdom of God unless you're born of water and spirit. So people always ask, okay, what does this mean, water and spirit? You open up some commentaries, you're going to see about five or six different options. If you take a look just at the scriptures and the text, take a look at it in the context, take a look at verse 5 in relationship to verse 3, and you'll see that they are parallel to one another. Let's read verse 3 again. Jesus answered, said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Verse 5, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. There's a parallelism happening there. And so what Jesus is saying, to be born again means to be born of water and of the Spirit. So there's plenty of different interpretations. What is water? Does that mean when a woman's water breaks, you know, that we're talking about physical birth and then we're talking about spiritual birth because of the Holy Spirit? No, to be born again, we're speaking of of being born of the Spirit. And so both water and the Spirit are speaking of the Spirit. Uh, The water refers to the cleansing ministry of the Holy Spirit. 
Spirit refers to the Holy Spirit. That's what the Holy Spirit does. This is Nicodemus. He's a Pharisee. He knows the Old Testament scriptures. Jesus speaks to a man and he knows his audience. And he talks to a man who knows the Holy Scriptures. And if we take a look at a place like Ezekiel 36, 24 to 28, as we take a look at the new covenant, and we take a look at how God's going to place a, his spirit in us and change our hearts, listen carefully. It says, uh, Ezekiel 36, 24, for I will take you from among the nations, gather you out all, of all the countries, and bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. It's cleansing power of the Holy Spirit. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. Then you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers. You shall be my people and I will be your God. To be born of the water and the Spirit is to be born again. The water refers to the cleansing ministry of the Spirit. Water and Spirit refer, Spirit refers to the one who does the ministry of cleansing. Simply, it means to be born again. So if you want to see the kingdom of God, if you want to enter the kingdom of God, the realm of the rule of God, you got to be born again got to be born of the water, experience the cleansing ministry of the Holy Spirit who changes and transforms your heart. He'll take out this heart of stone and put in a heart of flesh so that you can respond in faith and trust to Jesus. When the Spirit begins to do a work in your heart, it's called regeneration. It changes our desires, changes our disciplines. It changes our, our, our purpose is to follow the person and work of Christ. That's what the Holy Spirit does in our life. And so Jesus says, let me explain it to you. We're not talking about physical birth. We're talking about being born again, being born of the water and of the Spirit to see the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. You gotta be born from above. You gotta be born of the Spirit. You gotta be born of God. And so the key is we're gonna continue to talk about is, is not through obeying the law legalistically. No one can obey it perfectly. All have sinned, Romans 3.23. All have fallen short of the glory of God. And then Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. None of us measure up. All of us miss the mark. All of us fall short of God's glory and his standard. And it says in verse 7, Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. Hey, Nick, Nicodemus, don't let this surprise you. This is the truth. Most assuredly, most assuredly, most assuredly, don't let this surprise you. Uh, this might surprise him, and I'll tell you the reason why. Because, you know, when you were a Gentile and you wanted to uh, become a, a Jew... You know, there was a process that you went through and, and we often, it, they would often refer to those as, as, as little children, those who were born again in this essence. And so, you know, it's one thing for the Gentiles, those dirty dogs, you know, need, who need cleansing. But the Jews, God's chosen people, born of the seed of law of God and the word of God set apart to God and received the promises of God, certainly not them needing to be born again. Certainly, maybe the Gentiles, maybe those, those folks, you know, who were taking part in idol worship and all of the rest, but the Jew, Nicodemus, even among the Jews, I mean, Nicodemus is a man who is set apart, a significant man. A man who rules over the Jews, a man who knows the scriptures inside and out, the religious elites of his day. This is the seminary professor of the day. If there was a pope, I mean, and there was someone, we were looking at the, the resumes of who would be the next pope. Nicodemus is the guy that we would choose. And Jesus looks at him and says, don't let this surprise you, Nicodemus. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. Then he says in verse 8, as he talks about the Spirit, the wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. It's nighttime, it's evening. You can almost picture it. 
Jesus and Nicodemus are having this dialogue and you can feel the wind brush across their face. And Jesus, he takes this, this illustration, he says the wind, it's funny because in the Greek, pneuma is the wind and it's also the spirit, so there's a play on words here. And so when he talks about the wind, I mean, he's talking about the spirit and he says the wind, you know, it blows where it wishes. You can't control it. You don't know where it's at, but you know the evidence that it's there. You see the, the leaves rustling. So is the spirit. You can't control it. There's a mystery to it, but you see the evidence of it. What's the evidence of the Holy Spirit? Is it is blown into your life and you receive new life and the Spirit of God is breathed into you, a changed and transformed life, a regenerated heart. The heart of stone is taken out and you get a, a heart of flesh to respond to the person and work of, of Jesus Christ. You see the fruit of the Spirit. You see the love, the joy, the peace, the patience, the kindness, the goodness, the faithfulness, the gentleness, the self-control. To be born again, the Holy Spirit is a necessity. It changes your heart, but it's also a mystery. Then in verse 9, Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? Come on, Nick. This is Nick, Nicodemus. He is significant. He is, I mean, he's the ruler of the Jews. He is, as Jesus is going to say, the teacher, not just a, 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 it's a definite article, the teacher of Israel, you know? Not indefinite, not a teacher, but, but the teacher. Jesus answered and said to him, are you the teacher of Israel and you do not know these So the instruction of Jesus, as we got to read through this, it includes Jesus' explanation of what it means to be born again. But as we pick up in verse 10, it also includes Jesus' correction of Nicodemus' ignorance. And Jesus is quite straightforward with him because he first begins and criticizes his ignorance. Verse 10, are you the teacher of Israel and you do not know these things? He criticizes it and then he talks about the source of it. So why is Nicodemus, a man who is so educated, who knows the word of God, who's memorized the law of God, but he's not, this is not making sense to him. Jesus is gonna tell us, most assuredly, once again, who's the source of authority and the giver of authority uh, of truth, Jesus. Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen and you do not receive our witness. In other words, the truth is not the problem. Jesus says, as alongside of the prophets, we've told you the truth. I declare to you the truth. It's not that you don't have the truth. It's that you've rejected the authority of the one who gives it. Jesus is the word become flesh. Jesus is God. The reason they reject Jesus is not because they don't have enough information, but they reject the testimony of the one who provides it. They reject the eyewitness account and Jesus, he speaks to Nicodemus and all those he represents, elites of their day, as Jesus, the son of God, the eternal word of God becomes flesh, comes on scene and they miss him because they reject his authority and his testimony. Verse 12, if I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you Heavenly things. Jesus says, I speak to you heavenly realities using earthly illustrations. I just spoken to you by saying you got to be born again. Not born of the flesh, but born from above, born of the spirit. As I talk about the spirit and the ministry of the spirit in the life of individuals, you don't know where it's at. There's a mystery to it, but you see the evidence of of the regenerated heart that occurs and the transformation that follows when it enters the life. Jesus looks at Nicodemus, he says, if you can't understand these things, how am I supposed to teach you about these other heavenly realities? You wouldn't believe them. The reason he would not believe them is because him and those who represent him 
are those who have rejected the authority of Jesus. Who is Jesus? I mean, as we find ourselves in chapter 3, as we are introduced to the prologue, as Jesus has taken on these disciples, he's not just a man or a prophet. He is the Messiah. He's the Word become flesh who's dwelt among us. And if he is who he says that he is, shouldn't we submit and surrender our lives to him? Isn't he a, the one that we should respond to and believe? And as believers continue to put our trust and our faith in him, Whatever we face in this world, whatever struggles we go through, whatever crossroads we find ourselves in, that we would turn to Jesus, the authority over our life, the source of truth and the giver of truth. Then Jesus says, no one has ascended to heaven. So Jesus says, this is the authority of my testimony. No one has gone up to heaven. No man can go up to heaven and, and then come down and then tell you what they saw. Jesus, no one who has the testimony I have. Why? Because he's the eternal word of God become flesh. He's the eternal son of God, the second person of the Trinity. That's why. And so he says, no one has ascended to heaven. No one can tell you these heavenly realities. But he who came down from heaven, that is the son of man who is in heaven. You want to know? These, about these heaven real, heavenly realities, how you can get into heaven, what salvation is all about. It's not about working harder or obeying a list of rules or living a life that perfectly aligns with the law because no one can do that. You must be born again. And Jesus says, I'm coming from heaven. That's the authority of my testimony. And verse 14, as Moses must be lifted up. Hmm, interesting. Now we're, we're comparing Jesus to a snake. You ever see that in scripture? <laughs> Jesus, he says, okay, now about how this whole regeneration thing takes place. And he calls back in, in numbers when the, the children of Israel were following Moses into the promised land and they had seen the miracles of God. They'd seen the plagues that had taken place. They saw the Red Sea split into two. I mean, they saw Jesus and all that he did and then they start to grumble. Start to get upset. They start to complain. They no longer believe. And so God decides to discipline the children of Israel. He sends venomous snakes. I mean, that'll scare you, right? And these venomous snakes start biting people and they start dropping dead. And they're like, Moses, you got to do something. So Moses, he calls out to God, and God says, what you're going to do is you're going to take a, a stick, you're gonna, and you're going to put a bronze snake on that, and you're going to lift it up. And all the people who look to it, all those people who simply look a bit, venom of the snake will not be effective, and they will not die. So that's what happens in Numbers. Interesting thing, so... So, so, you know, if you get bit by a snake, it's kind of odd, you know? Like, can you imagine Moses coming up to these children, making their way through the wilderness, trying to get to the promised land? Hey, guys, so sorry about this snake thing and all, but here's what we're going to do. We're going to have a bronze snake. We're going to put it on there, and we're going to pop it up. And so all you got to do is look at it. A lot of people would say, that's nuts. But when you get bit and you're about to die, you're like, where's the snake at? I'm going to look, right? Isn't it amazing that, that, that Jesus is saying in the same way you look at the snake, Jesus, Jesus says here, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him, looks to him in faith, should not perish but have eternal life. Whoa, that sounds incredibly simple. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. We stand condemned We've all missed the mark. We're deserving of God's wrath and we're deserving of, of God's judgment. And you're saying all I have to do is look to Jesus in faith. That's all. You don't have to change your life before you come to Jesus. You don't have to clean up your language. You don't have to fix this or fix that. Come to Jesus and he'll regenerate your heart with the power of his Holy Spirit. And in this process of sanctification, he'll begin to change you moment by moment and day by day. And one day you will have a glorified body and the presence of sin will be no more. All you gotta do is look to Jesus in faith. All you have to do is 
trust him. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever should believe in him should not perish with everlasting life. I don't know about you, but that's the first verse ever memorized. It's a verse that as I get older, as I get to dig into the word more and more, as I get to teach and preach the word of God, what an incredible privilege that that verse or meaning every time I read it. For God so loved the world, everybody, that he gave his only begotten son for you and for me. What an amazing thing. It says Jesus did not come into the world um, in verse 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. If you knew just how depraved and messed up we are, right? I mean, take a look at the world. It's pretty messed up. I mean, take a look at everything going on right now. You know, you don't have to be a Christian. Man, this, this, this place is messed up. You look at other people and you say, well, not me, you know. God, you know, don't judge me. You know, I, I, I'm pretty good compared to those people. And you take a look at the world and you say, man, we need God him to fix things. I'm on a horse and destroy the depravity and the evil all around us. I mean, bring it on, God. Right? And then you're like, well, I guess I'm part of the judgment. I need Jesus. But what an amazing thing to know that the God of the universe, who is perfect, righteous, holy, all knowing, all present, he knows our hearts and all of the they're in all of our actions and all of our attitudes. And Jesus was sent to this earth not to condemn us or to bring judgment to us, but to save us. He's coming a second time to judge. We know that. But the first time he came us. He came to save us. See how, how much we need Jesus. How our hearts don't desire to serve him, but to rebel against him. Lost us and have such compassion for them and say, God, let my heart break for what breaks yours. There are people on the road to hell and eternal damnation who are going to spend an eternity without God and his people forever and ever. And we walk by them as if, it's nothing. God, let my heart break for what breaks yours. Let me see those you've placed in my circles of influence. Let me pray for them. Let me share my faith with them. Let me have your heart to go after them and invite them to know you. Not just to come to church or to read the Bible or to come to my house for dinner, but to introduce them to you. So we get to see the instruction of Jesus in these verses. Verse 17. Instruction teach us about Jesus. Number one, Jesus knows we all need him for salvation. That's what it tells us about. He knows we all need him for salvation. The whole world needs him for salvation. Secondly, Jesus knows what is keeping us from him. Jesus knew what was keeping Nicodemus from him. He had rejected his authority and those like him. That's why he shares that. Later in the Gospel of John, we learn that Nicodemus does come to faith. I mean, what a wonderful thing. I always like to ask this question if I have an opportunity to share the Gospel. Is, is there anything keeping you from trusting Jesus Lord in this moment? It's a clarifying moment. So can I ask you, if, if you know Jesus, if you, and if you haven't surrendered to him, is there anything keeping you today? Your belief, is there anything that's standing right in your relationship with him? I mean, is there unco- is there unre- just get right with the Lord? What a wonderful thing to do. Our forgiveness, faithful just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He knows we all need salvation and he knows what hinders us from getting there. 
Ultimately, we all need his spirit to change our heart, give us the desire to follow him, to believe in him, to trust in him, and to serve him. Thirdly, Jesus provides what we need for salvation through faith in Jesus as our Savior and Lord. If you need him, if there's nothing keeping you from him, trust in Jesus as your Savior and Lord. It would, it would, uh, it would be a terrible thing if we read John 3, 16 and I didn't invite somebody, if you're not a believer today, to put your trust in Jesus as your Savior and Lord, to admit your need for him, to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, believe in him, that he is the Savior of the world and to confess your sins to him. Um, as we open up for discussion, just want to ask this question. As we prepare to celebrate Easter this year, as you consider your traditions you grew up with or traditions you have a part of your family today, what is your favorite t- tradition that reminds you and your family about the good news of the gospel? Is there a specific tradition that you just enjoy around Easter? Any fun things you grew up with? I get maybe too many bunnies, right? <laughs> but what are our traditions? I think I like this question, and the reason I do is because it gives us ideas. Like, what, what are different things we can be doing with our families? Maybe different things that we can be reading. Uh, maybe just over a meal as you spend time around the table. I mean, what do you remember most about uh, just celebrating Easter each year? What, what do you enjoy the most during this time of year? Oh, yes. Yeah, so uh, Easter sunrise service, that's always exciting. Early to wake up, but man, is it worth it, yeah. (laughs) So Easter sunrise services, first thing in the morning, you remember what it's all about. Jesus rose from the dead, yeah. Anybody else want to share? Yeah, Steve. Yeah. Yeah, a wonderful time to just be around family, to eat an Easter meal, um, and then to talk about the meaning behind it. Yeah, yeah. Any, anyone else? Yeah, Adam. Hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, good Easter breakfast, certainly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sherry, I was going to share, say when I when I run by the river, when I jog by the river, I've always seen some real nice spots that that, that would be great service if we ever did one. So, that'd be neat. That'd be neat. Yeah. So, I mean, just to think about that. I mean, as we draw near to Easter, uh, what are different things that we can do to continue to remind ourselves? What this, the gospel is all about as we consider John 3.16 and who Jesus is and what he's done, what he continues to do. So uh, we were introduced first to the interaction between Nicodemus and Jesus, the instruction of Jesus to Nicodemus who reveals, okay, Nicodemus, this is what's standing between you and God. This is what's standing between you and eternal life. You know, you've rejected the authority of the one who has come and you're speaking to, to the Christ, the Messiah. I mean, this is, this is it. And thirdly, we see the, the application. I mean, what's the takeaway as we consider the, the two responses to Jesus? I want two responses to Jesus, whether to believe in him or to reject him. Verse 18, he who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe in him is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Okay, so... In a certain respect, God doesn't send anyone to hell. We choose it for ourselves. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father except through him. You reject Christ, you stand condemned. We either are condemned or we place our faith and trust in Jesus and he pays the penalty for our sin, died on the cross for for our sin, paid the penalty, grants us everlasting life. Verse 19, and this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world 
This is, tells us why men reject Christ. That the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light. It's not a love for God, his will, his word, but a rebellious heart that loves sin and the things that are antithetical to the will of God and to the, will, to the word of God because their deeds were evil. Those who reject the light are those who have a desire to who love the light, but also desire to continue to persist in sin. I love my sin. I love the pleasure it brings. I don't like the consequences. Jesus is so much better. Jesus is so much better. If you've been following Christ for any amount of time, you can testify Jesus is so much better. A marriage where Christ is at the center, so much a better marriage than when Christ isn't. A mind where Christ is the center, so much better when Christ is not. A family where Christ is the center, so much better. A church where Jesus is front and center is so much better than when he's not. And he's knocking on the door saying, let me in, as you read about the seven churches in Revelation. They persist in their evil because they, their deeds were evil. 20, for everyone practicing evil hates to the light, lest his deeds be exposed. So they persist in their evil. They love the darkness. And also, they don't come to the light because they know their sin will be exposed in the light. Eventually, all our sin is, is going to be out there, you know. It's part of it. Better to deal with it at the cross now. Wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is everlasting life. Verse 21, but he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. But he who does the truth, how do you do the truth? Who is this speaking of here? Speaking of the one who has been born again, born of the water and born of the spirit, born of the cleansing ministry of the spirit. The spirit of God regenerates our hearts and demonstrates, shows us what is true and what is not. And we follow Christ and him crucified and he changes and transforms our life forever. But he who does the truth comes to the light, comes to Jesus. He is the light of the world. That his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. We're now talking about the fruit of the Spirit as it's evidenced in our lives, as we've been changed and as we have been transformed. And as believers, as Christians, we don't walk in the flesh. We walk in the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. What's the biggest takeaway here? Jesus is the source of authority. He's the he, or he's the source of truth, excuse me. He's the giver of truth. He is the final authority in all matters to which he speaks. And if you want to see the kingdom of God, if you want to enter the kingdom of God, the key is by placing your faith, your trust in Jesus as your Savior and your Lord. These things are written so that you may believe. It's an intellectual agreement with these things. Okay, I, I get that. I, I think these Jesus was not just a man or a prophet. He must have been the Messiah. No, trust him as your Savior and Lord. These things are written for you to believe. You and I to continue to believe. And these so that we might experience the abundant life that he offers in his name. Wow. That'll get you excited. That'll get you ready and prepared for Easter Sunday. That'll get you moving and, 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 and grooving as you draw near to Palm Sunday and Good Friday and then Easter Sunday as we hit Resurrection Sunday. What a motivation if you've got someone in your circles of influence to say, hey, I go to a church and I want to invite you to, G to, 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 to introduce you to Jesus. I mean, come to church. The gospel's going to be shared. We're going to have some breakfast. Good Friday, we're going to have a service there. Palm Sunday, we're going to talk about the, the triumphant entry of Jesus. Invite people. Who are those people that God has placed on your heart and your mind? Who are those people uh, that you cross paths with at work or 
uh, maybe even in the doctor's office or in the grocery store. If there's somebody who you can invite to meet Jesus, uh, God will provide the opportunity. And, and we don't have to do all the work. All we have to do is point, hey, Jesus is the one, you know? You don't have to have all the answers. Just point, Jesus is the answer. Take a look at his word. We don't have to have all the answers. Jesus is. Pray. Father, we thank you and praise you uh, for this narrative and this text and for this reminder of the truth of, 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 of the need to be born again. I pray, Father, um, if there's someone here today or maybe even be listening to this who, who hasn't trusted Jesus as their Savior and Lord, and they've heard John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, Father, in a moment like this, they would turn to you uh, and, and express their need for you Express it this way. Father, I recognize I'm a sinner. I miss the mark. I admit my need for you. I know the source of, of sin in my life that is in rebellion against you. But I know that's why Jesus came. He died on the cross in order to take my place and to take my punishment, uh, to, to redeem me, to pay the debt that I owe. I make Jesus my Savior. I make him my Lord. Father, as believers, I pray that this would strengthen our faith that we, would, they would, that we would so be passionate about the truth of your word and who Jesus is. And as, as Easter draws near, I pray, Lord, that you would open up, the, open up our eyes to see who are those people we, we need to invite. Father, I pray that you would break our hearts for what break your, breaks yours. For those who, those who don't know you, I pray, Lord, that we would have such compassion for them, that we would, we would point them to you them to church or just sitting down with a meal with them, Lord. We pray, Lord, that you just guide and direct us in that. Give us the words to say. Pray that we would be available to serve you, to honor you, and glorify you. But we thank you for these things, and we pray your blessing upon your word as we head out. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.